I guess in this video what I'm trying to do is tell my story. A young innocent girl who, you know, obviously nothing like this should have ever happened to anybody. It, this is every family's worst nightmare. Really, truly, it is. It's, there's no worse nightmare. That's what you worry. You worry some bad person's going to hurt the person you love. And somebody's going to reach into your family and, and take a heart out of it effectively. He knew what he was taking and it did not deter him in any way, shape or form because he is a monster. We're gonna find you. We'll find you. You know, you can you can do what you're doing for a little while, but it's not forever and, and we'll find you. Tess Ritchie was born on November 30th, 1994 in North Bay, Ontario, Canada. The youngest of five daughters in the family, she was adored for her kindness and delightful humor. Her bond with her sister, Rachel, was particularly special as they were closer in age. She was my best friend. Like, she was, she just, she knew how to make me laugh every time. Like, every time. At the age of 10, Tess cut off and donated her hair to burn victims and the terminally ill. In her teens, she advocated for animal rights and ran charity marathons. Tess attended E.W. Norman Public School and Whittafield Secondary School. After finishing high school, she worked at the Days Inn Hotel in North Bay, where she became an assistant manager. Driven by her aspirations to explore the world, Tess eventually enrolled in a flight services program at Seneca College in Toronto. Following her graduation in July 2017, she began applying for airline jobs. Despite her efforts, however, Tess encountered challenges in securing employment. Still determined to fulfill her travel aspirations, she decided to learn Italian with the goal of working as an au pair in Italy. In the meantime, she juggled two part-time jobs to make ends meet. In late 2017, Tess faced another setback when she went through a difficult breakup with her boyfriend, Julian. Looking for some much-needed emotional support, she decided to visit her sister, Rachel, on November 24, 2017. The siblings spent the day discussing the breakup, with Rachel doing her best to console her sister. To lift Tess's spirits, the pair went shopping and visited a dog park. Tess had also arranged to spend the evening with Riley Simard. She was a high school classmate from North Bay whom Tess hadn't seen in years. Riley had relocated to Toronto in the summer of 2017, and the opportunity to reconnect felt timely for both of them. The friends agreed to meet at Cruz and Tangos, a popular drag bar in the church in Wellesley area. Rachel's partner then requested an Uber for Tess. As the vehicle pulled up, Tess bid her sister goodbye and hurriedly made her way to the car. Little did they know, it'll be the last time they'll see each other. Tess arrived at the club at around midnight on November 25th, 2017. While waiting for Riley, she ordered a beer and texted her sister Rachel to let her know she arrived safely. She then spent the rest of the evening partying with her friend. That morning, Rachel texted her sister back, asking how her night out went. When she didn't get an immediate reply, she simply assumed Tess was still asleep. At about 6.30 p.m., Rachel became concerned since her sister still hadn't responded. She realized that her previous messages to Tess weren't delivered, so she tried to call her. However, it went straight to voicemail. Rachel found it unusual as she knew Tess always had her phone in her hand. She then tried to contact her sister's friends, ex-lovers, and co-workers, but none of them had any idea where she was. Rachel's partner also went to Tess's apartment in Scarborough to check, but she wasn't there. At this point, panic began to set in. Rachel started to fear that her sister might have been arrested and thrown in the drunk tank, so she frantically called the police station to verify. In addition, she also contacted nearby hospitals to see if her sister somehow ended up there. The Toronto Police Service confirmed that Tess wasn't apprehended the previous night. The TPS 41 Division then initiated a missing persons investigation for her, focusing on the area surrounding her Scarborough apartment. As part of their search process, the investigators interviewed Tess's friend, Riley Simard, who was with her the night she went missing. Riley revealed that she and Tess went on a drinking binge at the bar and left at about 1.30 a.m. She added that shortly after leaving, they walked to a home on nearby Dundonald Street. There, they hung out on a porch with a woman who lived there. Along with them was a man they met at the club. As she was too intoxicated that night, Riley couldn't recall who they were or how she and Tess ended up talking to them. At around 4 a.m., Riley got a text from her boyfriend asking her where she was. 
This prompted her to head home. Her last memory of Tess was seeing her on the porch with those two individuals. The Ritchie family also notified the police that in the early hours of November 25th, 2017, they received an update from the Fitbit account that Tess shared with her mother. The update indicated that Tess took about 300 steps at a little past 3 a.m. Moreover, the family added that Tess's Uber account, which had her mother's credit card information, notified them at about 4 a.m. that same day. It showed that Tess requested a ride but canceled shortly after. Guided by these revelations, the police carried on with their search. Meanwhile, Tess's mother, Christine Hermiston, was getting more anxious as hours passed. She had been living with Tess in Scarborough throughout 2017. However, she returned to North Bay in early November to tend to her property there. Unwilling to simply wait for the police, Christine took matters into her own hands. On November 27, 2017, she drove 400 miles from North Bay to Toronto to join the search for her youngest child. Along with her was nurse Anne Brazeau, whose daughter had been friends with Tess since elementary. While the police primarily focused their search efforts within Scarborough, the pair of mothers went to work in the church in Wellesley area where Tess was last seen. For the next two days, they handed out flyers and asked passers-by to see if anyone had information regarding Tess's whereabouts. On the afternoon of November 29th, a day before Tess's 23rd birthday, Christine and Anne were putting up posters when they noticed a construction site at 582 Church Street somehow. Christine felt compelled to explore the area. And they did. There was just something very eerie about that construction site that was drawing me. And I really think that if I had a followed my gut instinct, um, I would have found her sooner. They went around the building and opened trash cans to see if they could find something. Later on, they went to the driveway adjacent to the building. As Christine walked ahead, Anne noticed an outdoor stairwell and decided to check it out. When she peered into the bottom of it, she made a startling discovery. Lying on the concrete floor was the lifeless body of Tess, with her face completely blue. Utterly shocked, Anne cried out for Christine to come back. The latter then swiftly turned and rushed to the stairwell, where she could only let out a scream of horror upon the sight of her daughter. Two women outside were screaming that there's a body uh, in the alleyway. One of them was the mother and her friend. Um, one of the ladies outside called the police. They came in and um, checked what was going on, and that was it. It's horrific. Immediately, she called her daughter Rachel to break the heart-wrenching news. At around 4 p.m., officers from the TPS 51 Division arrived at the scene to inspect the area and retrieve Tess's body for examination. The following day, November 30th, the Toronto Police Service held a press conference to announce the tragic discovery. Some of the journalists criticized them for the fact that it was Tess's mother who discovered her body and not the police. Deteran Sergeant Graham Gibson, however, was quick to dismiss these criticisms. Instead, he asserted that the local authorities were also doing their job. But Tessa Ritchie's mother and her friend were down here and did locate the deceased. Nobody's disputing that. The question was, were the police searching? And all indications that I have, although I wasn't involved in the search, was that they were down there checking and following up on the leads that they had. Nonetheless, two police officers would later be charged with misconduct for failing to investigate the case properly. These officers knew where Tess was last seen, but didn't thoroughly search the properties within the area. Days after Tess's body was found, tributes began pouring in at the site where she was discovered. Many left flowers and love letters in honor of her memory. The police initially did not consider her death as suspicious. This was because her body didn't have visible signs of trauma. Moreover, her purse and her cell phone were still in her possession. She did have a gash on her forehead, but the police thought it might have been caused by her accidental fall on the stairwell. However, an autopsy would later reveal that she died of neck compression. In addition, forensics successfully collected specimens and saliva from her clothes. From there, they were able to extract foreign DNA from an unidentified man. Due to these discoveries, Tessa's death was officially ruled as a homicide. So, on December 1st, 2017, her case was turned over to the TPS Homicide Division. The investigators then worked on retrieving surveillance videos from the area where Tess was last seen. Moreover, they also began interviewing potential witnesses to the case. On December 8th, 2017, the Toronto Police Service held another press conference. 
This time, Dan and Sergeant Graham Gibson outlined the sequence of events that led to Tess's death. The November 25th footage from Cruz and Tango showed Tess and Riley Samard inside the club at around midnight. At a little past 2 a.m., Tess and Riley were asked by the security to leave the club. An intoxicated Tess tried to argue with a bouncer before they were shown the door. Outside, the two chatted briefly with other people who had also just left the bar. By 2.20 a.m., Tess and Riley walked northbound on Church Street. Eventually, a man whom they spoke to minutes ago followed them. The three then resumed chatting on the sidewalk. A brief moment later, Tess attempted to flag down a passing cab, but the man waved it off in an attempt to make her stay. The three then headed to a hot dog cart at the corner of Church and Wellesley. Here, Tess and Riley got into an argument with a vendor, which resulted in the latter spraying mustard all over the food cart. The group then ran away, screaming and laughing. This caught the attention of a woman named Michelle Teep, who was standing on the porch of her house at 50 Dundonald Street. Tess then spotted Michelle and approached her to apologize for their rowdy behavior. The group subsequently began conversing with Michelle, during which Tess opened up about her recent heartbreak. Their talk lasted about 20 minutes, with Michelle and Tess eventually exchanging numbers. At about 4 a.m., Riley informed Tess that she had to leave. This upset the latter, but the man who was with them quickly placed his hand on Tess's shoulder to calm her down. Riley then walked westbound on Dundonald Street to take a streetcar home. Shortly after Riley left, Tess headed to Church Street and ordered an Uber pool ride. However, the man followed her and once again convinced her to stay. They then sat on a bench in the corner of Church and Dundonald, where they spoke for a few minutes. The last CCTV footage of Tess was captured from the driveway of a construction site. It showed her walking hand in hand with the man as they headed towards a stairwell. Unfortunately, no cameras were pointing at the stairwell, so it was unclear what happened between the two. About 45 minutes later, the man re-emerged, this time alone, and walked out of the vicinity. On December 10, 2017, the Toronto Police Service released images of the man to the public and appealed for help in identifying him. The Ritchie family later saw the pictures, but confirmed that they didn't know the man. It's almost like I know who he is, but I just, I don't know who he is, you know, and the struggle to, I don't know, it's just, it's been a struggle to try and reconcile that. Nevertheless, they vowed to do everything they could to locate him and ensure he faced the consequences for what he did to Tess. As long as I'm a human being, uh, I will feel the need to have them off the street to make it safe for you, you know, in your little neck and, and everybody else that can't protect themselves from a madman. I mean, you just, you can't, you can't hurt our girl and get away with it. And that's why the army of supporters, you're not going to get away with it. We're going to show you that she wasn't trashed the way you loved her, that she was loved, that she was somebody, that she meant everything to us. At about 9 p.m. that night, an individual contacted the TPS 11 division and claimed to be the man in the pictures. He identified himself as Kalen Schlater. Schlater, his parents, and his lawyer then went to the police station. He spoke briefly with the homicide division, but refused to give an official statement. Schlater's parents also brought food and drinks for him while he was in detention. Unbeknownst to them, this would pave the way for the investigators to build a solid case against him. When Schlater threw the water bottle in the trash bin, an officer retrieved it immediately. They then took it to forensics to obtain DNA samples from him. The authorities eventually released Schlater as they didn't have sufficient evidence yet to arrest him. However, they kept their eye on him while genetic experts analyzed the samples. The experts then began working on comparing Schlater's DNA sample to the one found in Tess's clothes. And the result was astounding. It was a perfect match. The foreign DNA from Tess's clothing belonged to Kalen Schlater. With this discovery, the Toronto Police Service formally apprehended him. Yesterday at about 11 p.m., uh, we were able to effect the arrest of the uh, person responsible for Tessa's murder. Uh, we're alleging that he's responsible, that he was arrested for second-degree murder, and his name is Kalen Schlatter. The arrest took place on February 4th, 2018, at about 11 p.m. at the Cineplex Cinemas Queensway in Etobicoke. At that time, Schlater had just finished watching the Super Bowl with his parents. The next day, he was taken to 13 Division and placed inside a holding cell. With him were two undercover police posing as prisoners. 
They found out quickly how much Schlater enjoyed talking. He began by sharing how thrilling the Super Bowl was. Then, he opened up about his love for video games. Eventually, he started bragging about having already been intimate with more than 40 women despite his age. In addition, he also disclosed being into rough lovemaking sessions. However, he stopped short of admitting what he did to Tess, claiming he was drunk and couldn't recall what happened. Months later, Schlater was transferred to another detention center. This time, he shared a cell with a man whose criminal record spanned decades. As they grew closer, Schlater ended up spilling the details of what really happened in the early hours of November 25th, 2017. The man then asked his cellmate's help to come up with stories or alibis he could tell the court. On January 13th, 2020, Kalen Schlater's trial officially began. During the hearing, the prosecution focused on the surveillance videos and genetic evidence linking Schlater to the crime. The two undercover police also testified about what he revealed to them in detention. But what bolstered the prosecution's case was the testimony of Schlater's erstwhile cellmate. Appalled by Schlater's revelations and his apparent lack of remorse, the man found himself compelled to testify against him in court. Schlater revealed to him that he and Tess made out in the stairwell at 582 Church Street. However, Tess eventually told him to stop, which got him upset. Subsequently, he wrapped a scarf around her neck and began choking her. He claimed that seeing Tess gasp for air and fight for her life excited him, so he tightened his hold even more. This ultimately led to her death. Schlater then admitted to desecrating Tess's body before he left the scene. Despite this testimony, the defense wouldn't go down without a fight. In a bizarre turn of events, Schlater's lawyers pinned the crime on a certain man who went by the initials JG. According to the defense, JG was also with Tess, Riley, and Schlater in the early hours of November 25th, 2017. JG admitted this in court. He also added that he was indeed looking for a woman to sleep with that night. Nevertheless, he vehemently denied being responsible for what happened to Tess. This was confirmed when his DNA samples were compared to those found on Tess's clothes and didn't match. Before the trial's conclusion, Christine and Tess's four sisters delivered victim impact statements. Overflowing with emotion, each of them expressed their profound love for Tess and conveyed the impact her absence had on their lives. After six weeks, the trial officially concluded, with the jury coming up with a verdict. To the courthouse now in one of the only cases continuing as the province's courts essentially shut down to limit the spread of COVID-19. Kaylin Schlater has been found guilty of first degree murder in the killing of Tess Ritchie in 2017. The Ritchie family were both grateful and relieved as they witnessed their beloved Tess finally attaining justice more than two years after her tragic passing. I mean, sadly, Tess had to give up her life to catch a monster. Well, we got the monster, right? The trial, it's just been really, just a really exhausting, long process. And it's, uh, it's nice to finally put it behind us, but, you know, it feels in a way like it's putting Tess behind us too. But, you know, it's, I'm just glad, I'm just glad he's off the streets now too. And nobody else can be hurt by him ever again, ever. Schlater was eventually sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the first 25 years. In January 2024, Schlater tried to appeal his case, but a panel of Ontario Court of Appeal judges denied it after only 10 minutes of deliberation. Six months after Schlater's conviction, the Ritchie family eventually sued him and the Toronto Police Service over the psychological devastation they suffered as a result of Tess's death. There's no amount of money. You can't put a price on this, but Will it pay for therapy possibly for the rest of our lives? Maybe. Will we be able to honor Tess in a way that may help save this from happening to other girls in the future? Possibly. Her mother, Christine, claimed that the family had experienced post-traumatic stress disorder, depression and anxiety since she passed away. She further added that her daughter would have still been alive had there been police presence in the neighborhood where she was attacked. They are seeking a total of $20 million in damages. As the Ritchie family attempts to recover from this harrowing nightmare, they vow to exert every effort to honor and preserve Tess's memory. Like I said, we all lost when we lost Tess. You don't know it because you didn't know Tess. She was the kindest, sweetest little girl. 
and she would take your hand and she'd walk down the street with you. She never hurt a soul and she was a mama's girl. She was my best friend, my baby. Um, Cass was more the mother than me. She really was. We'll never be happy, we'll never be complete again, but we can try to heal from here and do things in Tessie's name. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.